Section 20 of the Arabian Nights Entertainments, Volume 3. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Gillian Hendry. Section 20. The Story of Allah ad -Din, or The Wonderful Lamp. Part 5. When he arrived at the palace, everything was prepared for his reception, and when he came to the gate of the second court, he would have alighted from his horse, agreeably to the custom observed by the Grand Vizier, the Commander-in-Chief of the Empire, and Governors of Provinces of the first rank. But the Chief of the Mace-Bearers, who waited on him by the Sultan's order, prevented him, and attended him to the Grand Hall of Audience, where he helped him to dismount, though Allah ad -Din endeavoured to prevent him, but could not prevail. The officers formed themselves into two ranks at the entrance of the hall. The chief put Allah ad -Din on his right hand, and through the midst of them led him to the sultan's throne. As soon as the sultan perceived Allah ad -Din, he was no less surprised to see him more richly and magnificently habited than ever he had been himself, than struck at his good mien, fine shape, and a certain air of unexpected dignity very different from the meanness of his mother's late appearance. But notwithstanding, his amazement at surprise did not hinder him from rising off his throne and descending two or three steps, quick enough to prevent Allah ad throwing himself at his feet. He embraced him with all the demonstrations of joy at his arrival. After this civility, Allah ad would have thrown himself at his feet again, but he held him fast by the hand, and obliged him to sit close to the throne. Allah ad -Din then addressed the sultan, saying, I receive the honour which your majesty, out of your great condescension, is pleased to confer, but permit me to assure you that I have not forgotten that I am your slave, that I know the greatness of your power, and that I am not insensible how much my birth is below the splendour and lustre of the high rank to which I am raised. If any way, continued he, I could have merited so favourable a reception, I confess I owe it merely to the boldness which chance inspired in me to raise my eyes, thoughts, and desires to the divine princess, who is the object of my wishes. I ask your majesty's pardon for my rashness, but I cannot dissemble that I should die with grief were I to lose my hopes of seeing them accomplished. "'My son,' answered the sultan, embracing him a second time, "'you would wrong me to doubt for a moment of my sincerity. Your life from this moment is too dear to me not to preserve it, by presenting you with the remedy which is at my disposal. I prefer the pleasure of seeing and hearing you, before all your treasure added to my own. After these words, the sultan gave a signal, and immediately the air echoed with the sound of trumpets, oboes, and other musical instruments. And at the same time, the sultan led Ala ad -Din into a magnificent hall, where was laid out a most splendid collation. The sultan and Ala ad -Din ate by themselves, while the grand vizier and the great lords of the court according to their dignity and rank, sat at different tables. The conversation turned on different subjects, but all the while the sultan took so much pleasure in looking at his intended son-in-law that he hardly ever took his eyes off him, and throughout the whole of their conversation Ala ad -Din showed so much good sense as confirmed the sultan in the high opinion he had formed of him. After the feast the sultan sent for the chief judge of his capital, and ordered him to draw up immediately a contract of marriage between the princess Budir al Badur, his daughter, and Ala ad -Din. In the meantime, the sultan and he entered into another conversation on various subjects, in the presence of the grand vizier and the lords of the court, who all admired the solidity of his wit, the great ease and freedom wherewith he delivered himself, the justness of his remarks, and his energy in expressing them. When the judge had drawn up the contract in all the requisite forms, the sultan asked Allah ad -Din if he would stay in the palace and solemnize the ceremonies of marriage that day, to which he answered, 
sir though great is my impatience to enjoy your majesty's goodness yet i beg of you to give me leave to defer it till i have built a palace fit to receive the princess therefore i petition you to grant me a convenient spot of ground near your palace that i may the more frequently pay my respects and i will take care to have it finished with all diligence son said the sultan take what ground you think proper there is space enough on every quarter round my palace but consider i cannot see you too soon united with my daughter which alone is wanting to complete my happiness after these words he embraced alla ad deen again who took his leave with as much politeness as if he had been bred up and had always lived at court alla ad deen returned home in the order he had come amidst the acclamations of the people who wished him all happiness and prosperity as soon as he dismounted he retired to his own chamber took the lamp and called the genie as before who in the usual manner made him a tender of his service genie said alla ad deen i have every reason to commend your exactness in executing hitherto punctually whatever i have demanded but now if you have any regard for the lamp your protector you must show if possible more zeal and diligence than ever i would have you build me as soon as you can a palace opposite but at a proper distance from the sultan's fit to receive my spouse the princess badir al badur i leave the choice of the materials to you that is to say porphyry jasper agate lapis lazuli or the finest marble of various colours and also the architecture of the building but i expect that on the terraced roof of this palace you will build me a large hall crowned with a dome and having four equal fronts and that instead of layers of bricks the walls be formed of massive gold and silver laid alternately that each front shall contain six windows the lattices of all which except one which must be left unfinished shall be so enriched in the most tasteful workmanship with diamonds rubies and emeralds that they shall exceed everything of the kind ever seen in the world i would have an inner and outer court in front of the palace and a spacious garden but above all things take care that there be laid in a place which you shall point out to me a treasure of gold and silver coin besides the edifice must be well provided with kitchens and offices storehouses and rooms to keep choice furniture in for every season of the year i must have stables full of the finest horses with their equerries and grooms and hunting equipage there must be officers to attend the kitchens and offices and women slaves to wait on the princess you understand what i mean therefore go about it and come and tell me when all is finished by the time alla ad deen had instructed the genie resetting the building of his palace the sun was set the next morning before break of day our bridegroom whose love for the princess would not let him sleep was up when the genie presented himself and said sir your palace is finished come and see how you like it alla ad deen had no sooner signified his consent than the genie transported him thither in an instant and he found it so much beyond his expectation that he could not enough admire it the genie led him through all the apartments where he met with nothing but what was rich and magnificent with officers and slaves all habited according to their rank and the services to which they were appointed the genie then showed him the treasury which was opened by a treasurer where alla ad deen saw heaps of purses of different sizes piled up to the top of the ceiling and disposed in most excellent order the genie assured him of the treasurer's fidelity and thence led him to the stables where he showed him some of the finest horses in the world and the grooms busy in dressing them from thence they went to the storehouses which were filled with all things necessary both for food and ornament when alla ad deen had examined the palace from top to bottom and particularly the hall with the four-and-twenty windows and found it much beyond whatever he could have imagined he said genie no one can be better satisfied than i am and indeed i should be much to blame if i found any fault 
there is only one thing wanting which i forgot to mention that is to lay from the sultan's palace to the door of the apartment designed for the princess a carpet of fine velvet for her to walk upon the genie immediately disappeared and alla ad deen saw what he desired executed in an instant the genie then returned and carried him home before the gates of the sultan's palace were opened when the porters who had always been used to an open prospect came to open the gates they were amazed to find it obstructed and to see a carpet of velvet spread from the grand entrance they did not immediately look how far it extended but when they could discern alla ad deen's palace distinctly their surprise was increased the news of so extraordinary a wonder was presently spread through the palace the grand vizier who arrived soon after the gates were open being no less amazed than others at this novelty ran and acquainted the sultan but endeavoured to make him believe it to be all enchantment vizier replied the sultan why will you have it to be enchantment you know as well as i that it must be alla ad deen's palace which i gave him leave to build for the reception of my daughter after the proof we have had of his riches can we think it strange that he should raise a palace in so short a time he wished to surprise us and let us see what wonders are to be done with money in only one night confess sincerely that the enchantment you talk of proceeds from a little envy on account of your son's disappointment the hour of going to council put an end to the conversation when alla ad deen had been conveyed home and had dismissed the genie he found his mother up and dressing herself in one of those suits which had been brought her by the time the sultan rose from the council alla ad deen had prepared his mother to go to the palace with her slaves and desired her if she saw the sultan to tell him she should do herself the honour to attend the princess towards evening to her palace accordingly she went but though she and the women slaves who followed her were all dressed like sultanesses yet the crowd was not near so great as the preceding day because they were all veiled and had each an upper garment on agreeable to the richness and magnificence of their habits alla ad deen mounted his horse and took leave of his paternal house for ever taking care not to forget his wonderful lamp by the assistance of which he had reaped such advantages and arrived at the utmost height of his wishes and went to the palace in the same pomp as the day before as soon as the porters of the sultan's palace saw alla ad deen's mother they went and informed the sultan who immediately ordered the bands of trumpets cymbals drums fifes and oboys placed in different parts of the palace to play so that the air resounded with concerts which inspired the whole city with joy the merchants began to adorn their shops and houses with fine carpets and silks and to prepare illuminations against night the artisans of every description left their work and the populace repaired to the great space between the royal palace and that of alla ad deen which last drew all their attention not only because it was new to them but because there was no comparison between the two buildings but their amazement was to comprehend by what unheard-of miracle so magnificent a palace could have been so soon erected it being apparent to all that there were no prepared materials or any foundations laid the day before alla ad deen's mother was received in the palace with honour and introduced into the princess Badir al Badur's apartment by the chief of the eunuchs as soon as the princess saw her she rose saluted and desired her to sit down on a sofa and while her women finished dressing and adorning her with the jewels which alla ad deen had presented to her a collation was served up at the same time the sultan who wished to be as much with his daughter as possible before he parted with her came in and paid the old lady great respect. Alla ad deens mother had talked to the sultan in public, but he had never seen her with her veil off, as she was then, and though she was somewhat advanced in years, she had the remains of a good face, which showed what she had been in her youth. The sultan, who had always seen her dressed very meanly, not to say poorly, was surprised to find her as richly and magnificently attired 
as the princess's daughter this made him think Allah ad deen equally prudent and wise in whatever he undertook when it was night the princess took her leave of the sultan her father their adieus were tender and accompanied with tears they embraced each other several times and at last the princess left her apartment for Allah ad deens palace with his mother on her left hand carried in a superb litter followed by a hundred women slaves dressed with surprising magnificence all the bands of music which had played from the time Allah ad deens mother arrived being joined together led the procession followed by a hundred state ushers and the like number of black eunuchs in two files with their officers at their head four hundred of the sultan's young pages carried flambeaux on each side which together with the illuminations of the sultan's and ala ad deen's palaces made it as light as day in this order the princess proceeded in her litter on the carpet which was spread from the sultan's palace preceded by bands of musicians who as they advanced joining with those on the terraces of ala ad deen's palace formed a concert which increased the joyful sensations not only of the crowd assembled in the great square but of the metropolis and its environs at length the princess arrived at the new palace Allah ad deen ran with all imaginable joy to receive her at the grand entrance his mother had taken care to point him out to the princess in the midst of the officers who surrounded him and she was charmed with his person adorable princess said Allah ad deen accosting her and saluting her respectfully as soon as she had entered her apartment if i have the misfortune to have displeased you by my boldness in aspiring to the possession of so lovely a princess and my sultan's daughter i must tell you that you ought to blame your bright eyes and charms not me prince as i may now call you answered the princess i am obedient to the will of my father and it is enough for me to have seen you to tell you that i obey without reluctance Alla ad deen charmed with so agreeable and satisfactory an answer would not keep the princess standing but took her by the hand which he kissed with the greatest demonstration of joy and led her into a large hall illuminated with an infinite number of wax candles where by the care of the genie a noble feast was served up the dishes were of massive gold and contained the most delicate viands the vases basins and goblets were gold also and of exquisite workmanship and all the other ornaments and embellishments of the hall were answerable to this display the princess dazzled to see so much riches collected in one place said to Allah ad deen i thought prince that nothing in the world was so beautiful as the sultan my father's palace but the sight of this hall alone is sufficient to show i was deceived Allah ad deen led the princess to the place appointed for her and as soon as she and his mother were seated a band of the most harmonious instruments accompanied with the voices of beautiful ladies began a concert which lasted without intermission to the end of the repast the princess was so charmed that she declared she had never heard anything like it in the sultan her father's court but she knew not that these musicians were fairies chosen by the genie the slave of the lamp when the supper was ended there entered a company of female dancers who performed according to the custom of the country several figure dances singing at the same time verses in praise of the bride and bridegroom about midnight Allah ad deen's mother conducted the bride to the nuptial apartment and he soon after retired the next morning when Allah ad deen left the bridal chamber his attendants presented themselves to dress him and brought him another habit as rich and magnificent as that worn the day before he then ordered one of the horses appointed for his use to be got ready mounted him and went in the midst of a large troop of slaves to the sultan's palace the sultan received him with the same honours as before embraced him placed him on the throne near him and ordered a collation Allah ad deen said i beg your majesty will dispense with my eating with you to-day 
I came to entreat you to take a repast in the princess's palace, attended by your grand vizier and all the lords of your court. The sultan consented with pleasure, rose up immediately, and, preceded by the principal officers of his palace, and followed by all the great lords of his court, accompanied Alla ad -Din. The nearer the sultan approached Alla ad -Din's palace, the more he was struck with its beauty, but was much more amazed when he entered it, and could not forbear breaking out in exclamations of approbation. But when he came into the hall, and cast his eyes on the windows, enriched with diamonds, rubies, emeralds, all large perfect stones, he was so much surprised that he remained some time motionless. After he recovered himself, he said to his vizier, Is it possible that there should be such a stately palace so near my own, and I be an utter stranger to it till now? Sir, replied the grand vizier, your majesty may remember that the day before yesterday you gave Allah ad -Din, whom you accepted for your son-in-law, leave to build a palace opposite your own, and that very day at sunset there was no palace on this spot. But yesterday I had the honour first to tell you that the palace was built and finished. I remember, replied the sultan, but never imagined that the palace was one of the wonders of the world. For where in all the world besides shall we find walls built of massive gold and silver instead of brick, stone, or marble, and diamonds, rubies, and emeralds composing the windows? The sultan would examine and admire the beauty of all the windows, and counting them, found that there were but three and twenty so richly adorned. And he was greatly astonished that the twenty-fourth was left imperfect. Vizier, said he, for that minister made a point of never leaving him, I am surprised that a hall of this magnificence should be left thus imperfect. Sir, replied the Grand Vizier, without doubt Allah ad -Din only wanted time to finish this window like the rest, for it is not to be supposed but that he has sufficient jewels for the purpose, or that he will not complete it the first opportunity. Allah ad -Din, who had left the sultan to go and give some orders, returned just as the vizier had finished this remark. Son, said the sultan to him, this hall is the most worthy of admiration of any in the world. There is only one thing that surprises me, which is to find one of the windows unfinished. Is it from the forgetfulness or negligence of the workmen, or want of time, that they have not put the finishing stroke to so beautiful a piece of architecture. Sir, answered Alla ad -Din, it was for none of these reasons that your majesty sees it in this state. The omission was by design. It was by my orders that the workmen left it thus, since I wished that your majesty should have the glory of finishing this hall, and, of course, the palace. If you did it with this intention replied the sultan, I take it kindly, and will give orders about it immediately. He accordingly sent for the most considerable jewellers and goldsmiths in his capital. Allah ad -Din then conducted the sultan into the saloon, where he had regaled his bride the preceding night. The princess entered immediately afterwards, and received the sultan her father with an air that showed how happy she was with her marriage. Two tables were immediately spread with the most delicious meats, all served up in gold dishes. The sultan, princess, Alla ad -Din, his mother, and the grand vizier sat down at the first, and all the lords of the court at the second, which was very long. The sultan was much pleased with the cookery, and owned he had never eaten anything more excellent. He said the same of the wines, which were delicious, but what he most of all admired were four large sideboards, profusely furnished with large flagons, basins, and cups, all of massive gold, set with jewels. He was besides charmed with several bands of music, which were ranged along the hall, and formed most agreeable concerts. When the sultan rose from the table, he was informed that the jewellers and goldsmiths attended, upon which he returned to the hall, 
and showed them the window which was unfinished. "'I sent for you,' said he, "'to fit up this window in as great perfection as the rest. Examine them well, and make all the dispatch you can.' The jewellers and goldsmiths examined the three-and-twenty windows with great attention, and after they had consulted together to know what each could furnish, they returned and presented themselves before the sultan, whose principal jeweller, undertaking to speak for the rest, said, "'Sir, we are all willing to exert our utmost care and industry to obey your majesty, but among us all we cannot furnish jewels enough for so great a work.' "'I have more than are necessary,' said the sultan. "'Come to my palace, and you shall choose what may answer your purpose.' When the sultan returned to his palace, he ordered his jewels to be brought out, and the jewellers took a great quantity, particularly those Allah ad -Din had made him a present of, which they soon used, without making any great advance in their work. They came again several times for more, and in a month's time had not finished half their work. In short, they used all the jewels the sultan had, and borrowed of the vizier, but yet the work was not half done. Allah ad -Din, who knew that all the sultan's endeavours to make this window like the rest were in vain, sent for the jewellers and goldsmiths, and not only commanded them to desist from their work, but ordered them to undo what they had begun, and to carry all their jewels back to the sultan and to the vizier. They undid in a few hours what they had been six weeks about, and retired, leaving Allah ad -Din alone in the hall. He took the lamp which he carried about him, rubbed it, and presently the genie appeared. Genie, said Allah ad -Din, I ordered thee to leave one of the four-and-twenty windows of this hall imperfect, and thou hast executed my commands punctually. Now I would have thee make it like the rest. The genie immediately disappeared. Allah ad -Din went out of the hall, and returning soon after, found the window as he wished it to be, like the others. In the meantime, the jewellers and goldsmiths repaired to the palace, and were introduced into the sultan's presence, where the chief jeweller, presenting the precious stones which he had brought back, said, in the name of all the rest, "'Your majesty knows how long we have been upon the work you were pleased to set us about, in which we used all imaginable industry.' It was far advanced when Prince Allah ad -Din commanded us not only to leave off, but to undo what we had already begun, and bring your majesty your jewels back. The sultan asked them if Allah ad -Din had given them any reason for so doing, and they, answering that he had given them none, he ordered a horse to be brought, which he mounted, and rode to his son-in-law's palace, with some few attendants on foot. End of section 20。section 21 of the Arabian Nights Entertainments, Volume 3. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Gillian Hendry. Section 21. The story of Allah ad -Din, or the Wonderful Lamp. Part 6. When he came there, he alighted at the staircase which led up to the hall with the twenty-four windows, and went directly up to it without giving previous notice to Allah ad -Din. But it happened that at that very juncture Allah ad -Din was opportunely there, and had just time to receive him at the door. The sultan, without giving Allah ad -Din time to complain obligingly of his not having given notice, that he might have acquitted himself with the more becoming respect, said to him, Son, I come myself to know the reason why you commanded the jewellers to desist from work and take to pieces what they had done. Allah ad -Din disguised the true reason, which was that the sultan was not rich enough in jewels to be at so great an expense, but said, I beg of you now to see if anything is wanting. The sultan went directly to the window which was left imperfect, and when he found it like the rest, fancied that he was mistaken, examined the two windows on each side, and afterwards all the four-and-twenty. But when he was convinced that the window which several workmen had been so long about 
was finished in so short a time, he embraced Allah ad -Din and kissed him between his eyes. "'My son,' said he, "'what a man you are to do such surprising things, always in the twinkling of an eye. "'There is not your fellow in the world. "'The more I know, the more I admire you.' Ala ad -Din received these praises from the sultan with modesty, and replied in these words, Sir, it is a great honour to me to deserve your majesty's good will and approbation, and I assure you I shall study to deserve them more. The sultan returned to his palace, but would not let Ala ad -Din attend him. When he came there, he found his grand vizier waiting, to whom he related the wonder he had witnessed with the utmost admiration and in such terms as left the minister no room to doubt but that the facet was as the sultan related it though he was the more confirmed in his belief that alla ad -Din's palace was the effect of enchantment as he had told the sultan the first moment he saw it he was going to repeat the observation but the sultan interrupted him and said you told me so once before i see vizier you have not forgotten your son's espousals to my daughter the frank vizier plainly saw how much the sultan was prepossessed, therefore avoided disputes, and let him remain in his own opinion. The sultan, as soon as he rose every morning, went into the closet to look at Ala ad -Din's palace, and would go many times in a day to contemplate and admire it. Ala ad -Din did not confine himself in his palace, but took care to show himself once or twice a week in the town by going sometimes to one mosque, and sometimes to another, to prayers, or to visit the Grand Vizier, who affected to pay his court to him on certain days, or to do the principal lords of the court the honour to return their visits, after he had regaled them at his palace. Every time he went out, he caused two slaves, who walked by the side of his horse, to throw handfuls of money among the people as he passed through the streets and squares which were generally on those occasions crowded. Besides, no one came to his palace gates to ask alms, but returned satisfied with his liberality. In short, he so divided his time that not a week passed but he went either once or twice a-hunting, sometimes in the environs of the city, sometimes farther off, at which time the villages through which he passed felt the effects of his generosity, which gained him the love and blessings of the people and it was common for them to swear by his head. Thus, without giving the least umbrage to the sultan, to whom he paid all imaginable respect, Allah ad -Din, by his affable behaviour and liberality, had won the affections of the people, and was more beloved than the sultan himself. With all these good qualities, he showed a courage and a zeal for the public good, which could not be sufficiently applauded. He gave sufficient proofs of both, in a revolt on the borders of the kingdom, for he no sooner understood that the sultan was levying an army to disperse the rebels, than he begged the command of it, which he found not difficult to obtain. As soon as he was empowered, he marched with so much expedition, that the sultan heard of the defeat of the rebels before he had received an account of his arrival in the army. And though this action rendered his name famous throughout the kingdom, it made no alteration in his disposition, but he was as affable after his victory as before. Allah ad -Din had conducted himself in this manner several years, when the African magician, who undesignedly had been the instrument of raising him to so high a pitch of prosperity, recalled him to his recollection in Africa, whither, after his expedition, he had returned. And though he was almost persuaded that Allah ad -Din must have died miserably in the subterraneous abode where he had left him, yet he had the curiosity to inform himself about his end with certainty. And, as he was a great geomancer, he took out of a cupboard a square-covered box, which he used in his geomantic observations, then sat himself down on the sofa, set it before him, and uncovered it. After he had prepared and levelled the sand which was in it, with an intention to discover whether or no Alla ad -Din had died in the subterraneous abode, he cast the points, drew the figures, 
and formed a horoscope by which when he came to examine it he found that Allah ad deen instead of dying in the cave had made his escape lived splendidly was in possession of the wonderful lamp had married a princess and was much honoured and respected the magician no sooner understood by the rules of his diabolical art that Allah ad deen had arrived to this height of good fortune than his face became inflamed with anger and he cried out in a rage this sorry tailor's son has discovered the secret and virtue of the lamp i believed his death to be certain but find that he enjoys the fruit of my labour and study i will however prevent his enjoying it long or perish in the attempt he was not a great while deliberating on what he should do but the next morning mounted a barb set forwards and never stopped but to refresh himself and horse till he arrived at the capital of china he alighted took up his lodging in a khan and stayed there the remainder of the day and the night to refresh himself after so long a journey the next day his first object was to inquire what people said of Allah ad deen and taking a walk through the town he went to the most public and frequented places where persons of the best distinction met to drink a certain warm liquor which he had drunk often during his former visit as soon as he had seated himself he was presented with a cup of it which he took but listening at the same time to the discourse of the company on each side of him he heard them talking of ala ad deen's palace when he had drunk off his liquor he joined them and taking this opportunity inquired particularly of what palace they spoke with so much commendation from whence come you said the person to whom he addressed himself you must certainly be a stranger not to have seen or heard talk of prince alla ad deen's palace for he was called so after his marriage with the princess i do not say continued the man that it is one of the wonders of the world but that it is the only wonder of the world since nothing so grand rich and magnificent was ever beheld certainly you must have come from a great distance or some obscure corner not to have heard of it for it must have been talked of all over the world go and see it and then judge whether i have told you more than the truth forgive my ignorance replied the african magician i arrived here but yesterday and came from the farthest part of africa where the fame of this palace had not reached when i came away the business which brought me hither was so urgent that my sole object was to arrive as soon as i could without stopping anywhere or making any acquaintance but i will not fail to go and see it my impatience is so great i will go immediately and satisfy my curiosity if you will do me the favour to show me the way thither the person to whom the african magician addressed himself took a great pleasure in showing him the way to alla ad deen's palace and he got up and went thither instantly when he came to the palace and had examined it on all sides he doubted not but that alla ad deen had made use of the lamp to build it without attending to the inability of a poor tailor's son he knew that none but the genie the slaves of the lamp the attaining of which he had missed could have performed such wonders and piqued to the quick at ala ad deen's happiness and splendour he returned to the khan where he lodged the next point was to ascertain where the lamp was whether ala ad deen carried it about with him or where he kept it and this he was to discover by an operation of geomancy as soon as he entered his lodging he took his square box of sand which he always carried with him when he travelled and after he had performed some operations he found that the lamp was in ala ad deen's palace and so great was his joy at the discovery that he could hardly contain himself well said he i shall have the lamp and defy ala ad deen's preventing my carrying it off and making him sink to his original meanness from which he has taken so high a flight it was ala ad deen's misfortune at that time to be absent in the chase for eight days 
and only three were expired, which the magician came to know by this means. After he had performed the magical operation, which gave him so much joy, he went to the superintendent of the khan, entered into conversation with him on indifferent subjects, and among the rest told him he had been to see Alla ad -Din's palace, and after exaggerating on all that he had seen most worthy of observation, added, But my curiosity leads me farther, and I shall not be satisfied till I have seen the person to whom this wonderful edifice belongs. That will be no difficult matter, replied the master of the khan. There is not a day passes, but he gives an opportunity when he is in town, but at present he is not at the palace and has been gone these three days on a hunting match, which will last eight. The magician wanted to know no more. He took his leave of the superintendent of the khan, and returning to his own chamber, said to himself, This is an opportunity I ought by no means to neglect, but must make the best use of it. To that end, he went to a coppersmith, and asked for a dozen copper lamps, the master of the shop told him he had not so many by him, but if he would have patience till the next day, he would have them ready. The magician appointed his time, and desired him to take care that they should be handsome and well polished. After promising to pay him well, he returned to his inn. The next day the magician called for the twelve lamps, paid the man his full price, put them into a basket which he bought on purpose, and, with the basket hanging on his arm, went directly to Alla ad -Din's palace. As he approached, he began crying, Who will change old lamps for new ones? As he went along, a crowd of children collected, who hooted, and thought him, as did all who chanced to be passing by, a madman or a fool, to offer to change new lamps for old ones. The African magician regarded not their scoffs, hootings, or all they could say to him, but still continued crying, Who will change old lamps for new? He repeated this so often, walking backwards and forwards in front of the palace, that the princess, who was then in the hall with the four-and-twenty windows, hearing a man cry something, and not being able to distinguish his words, owing to the hooting of the children and increasing mob about him, sent one of her women slaves to know what he cried. The slave was not long before she returned, and ran into the hall laughing so heartily that the princess could not forbear herself. "'Well, Higgler,' said the princess, "'will you tell me what you laugh at?' "'Madam,' answered the slave, laughing still, "'who can forbear laughing?' to see a fool with a basket on his arm, full of fine new lamps, ask to change them for old ones. The children and mob, crowding about him, so that he can hardly stir, make all the noise they can in derision of him. Another female slave, hearing this, said, Now you speak of lamps. I know not whether the princess may have observed it, but there is an old one upon a shelf of the prince's robing room, and whoever owns it will not be sorry to find a new one in its stead. If the princess chooses, she may have the pleasure of trying if this fool is so silly as to give a new lamp for an old one, without taking anything for the exchange. The lamp this slave spoke of was the wonderful lamp which Alla ad -Din had laid upon the shelf before he departed for the chase. This he had done several times before, but neither the princess, the slaves, nor the eunuchs had ever taken notice of it. At all other times, except when hunting, he carried it about his person. The princess, who knew not the value of this lamp, and the interest that Alla ad -Din, not to mention herself, had to keep it safe, entered into the pleasantry, and commanded a eunuch to take it and make the exchange. The eunuch obeyed went out of the hall, and no sooner got to the palace gates than he saw the African magician, called to him, and showing him the old lamp, said, Give me a new lamp for this. The magician never doubted but that this was the lamp he wanted. There could be no other such in this palace, 
where every utensil was gold or silver. He snatched it eagerly out of the eunuch's hand, and thrusting it as far as he could into his breast, offered him his basket, and bade him choose which he liked best. The eunuch picked out one, and carried it to the princess, but the exchange was no sooner made than the place rung with the shouts of the children, deriding the magician's folly. The African magician gave everybody leave to laugh as much as they pleased. He stayed not long near the palace, but made the best of his way, without crying any longer, new lamps for old ones. His end was answered, and by his silence he got rid of the children and the mob. As soon as he was out of the square between the two palaces, he hastened down the streets which were the least frequented, and having no more occasion for his lamps or basket, set all down in an alley, where nobody saw him. Then going down another street or two, he walked till he came to one of the city gates, and pursuing his way through the suburbs, which were very extensive, at length reached a lonely spot, where he stopped for a time to execute the design he had in contemplation, never caring for his horse, which he had left at the can, but thinking himself perfectly compensated by the treasure he had acquired. End of section 21section twenty two of the arabian nights entertainments volume three translated by jonathan scott this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by gillian hendry the story of allah ad din or the wonderful lamp part seven in this place the african magician passed the remainder of the day till the darkest time of night when he pulled the lamp out of his breast and rubbed it at that summons the genie appeared and said, What wouldst thou have? I am ready to obey thee as thy slave, and the slave of all those who have that lamp in their hands, both I and the other slaves of the lamp. I command thee, replied the magician, to transport me immediately, and the palace which thou and the other slaves of the lamp have built in this city, with all the people in it, to Africa. The genie made no reply, but with the assistance of the other genie, the slaves of the lamp immediately transported him and the palace entire to the spot whither he was desired to convey it. As soon as the sultan rose the next morning, according to custom, he went into his closet to have the pleasure of contemplating and admiring Allah ad Din's palace. But when he first looked that way, and instead of a palace saw an empty space, such as it was before the palace was built. He thought he was mistaken, and rubbed his eyes, but when he looked again he still saw nothing more the second time than the first, though the weather was fine, the sky clear, and the dawn advancing had made all objects very distinct. He looked again in front, to the right and left, but beheld nothing more than he had formerly been used to see from his window. His amazement was so great that he stood for some time, turning his eyes to the spot where the palace had stood, but where it was no longer to be seen. He could not comprehend how so large a palace as Allah ad Din's, which he had seen plainly every day for some years, and but the day before, should vanish so soon, and not leave the least remains behind. "'Certainly,' said he to himself, "'I am not mistaken.' It stood there. If it had fallen, the materials would have lain in heaps, and if it had been swallowed up by an earthquake, there would be some mark left. At last, though he was convinced that no palace stood now opposite his own, he could not help staying some time at his window, to see whether he might not be mistaken. At last he retired to his apartment, not without looking behind him before he quitted the spot, ordered the Grand Vizier to be sent for, with expedition, and in the meantime sat down, his mind agitated by so many different conjectures that he knew not what to resolve. The Grand Vizier did not make the Sultan wait long for him, but came with so much precipitation that neither he nor his attendants, as they passed, missed Allah ad Din's palace, 
neither did the porters when they opened the palace gates observe any alteration when he came into the sultan's presence he said to him the haste in which your majesty sent for me makes me believe something extraordinary has happened since you know that this is a day of public audience and i should not have failed of attending at the usual time indeed said the sultan it is something very extraordinary as you say and you will allow it to be so tell me what is become of Alla ad deen's palace his palace replied the grand vizier in amazement i thought as i passed it stood in its usual place such substantial buildings are not so easily removed go into my closet said the sultan and tell me if you can see it the grand vizier went into the closet where he was struck with no less amazement than the sultan had been when he was well assured that there was not the least appearance of this palace he returned to the sultan well said the sultan have you seen alla ad deen's palace no answered the vizier but your majesty may remember that i had the honour to tell you that palace which was the subject of your admiration with all its immense riches was only the work of magic and a magician but your majesty would not pay the least attention to what i said the sultan who could not deny what the grand vizier had represented to him flew into the greater passion where is that impostor that wicked wretch said he that i may have his head taken off immediately sir replied the grand vizier it is some days since he came to take his leave of your majesty on pretence of hunting he ought to be sent for to know what is become of his palace since he cannot be ignorant of what has been transacted that is too great an indulgence replied the sultan command a detachment of horse to bring him to me loaded with chains the grand vizier gave orders for a detachment and instructed the officer who commanded them how they were to act that alla ad deen might not escape the detachment pursued their orders and about five or six leagues from the town met him returning from the chase the officer advanced respectfully and informed him the sultan was so impatient to see him that he had sent his party to accompany him home alla ad deen had not the least suspicion of the true reason of their meeting him but when he came within half a league of the city the detachment surrounded him when the officer addressed himself to him and said prince it is with great regret that i declare to you the sultan's order to arrest you and to carry you before him as a criminal i beg of you not to take it ill that we acquit ourselves of our duty and to forgive us alla ad deen who felt himself innocent was much surprised at this declaration and asked the officer if he knew what crime he was accused of who replied he did not then alla ad deen finding that his retinue was much inferior to this detachment alighted off his horse and said to the officers execute your orders i am not conscious that i have committed any offence against the sultan's person or government a heavy chain was immediately put about his neck and fastened round his body so that both his arms were pinioned down the officer then put himself at the head of the detachment and one of the troopers taking hold of the end of the chain and proceeding after the officer led alla ad deen who was obliged to follow him on foot into the city when this detachment entered the suburbs the people who saw alla ad deen thus led as a state criminal never doubted but that his head was to be cut off and as he was generally beloved some took sabres and other arms and those who had none gathered stones and followed the escort the last division faced about to disperse them but their numbers presently increased so much that the soldiery began to think it would be well if they could get into the sultan's palace before alla ad deen was rescued to prevent which according to the different extent of the streets they took care to cover the ground by extending or closing in this manner they with great difficulty arrived at the palace square and there drew up in a line till their officer and troopers with alla ad deen had got within the gates which were immediately shut 
Alla ad Deen was carried before the sultan, who waited for him, attended by the grand vizier, in a balcony, and as soon as he saw him, he ordered the executioner, who waited there for the purpose, to strike off his head, without hearing him or giving him leave to clear himself. As soon as the executioner had taken off the chain that was fastened about Alla ad Deen's neck and body, and laid down a skin stained with the blood of the many he had executed, he made the supposed criminal kneel down, and tied a bandage over his eyes. Then, drawing his sabre, took his aim by flourishing it three times in the air, waiting for the sultan's giving the signal to strike. At that instant, the grand vizier, perceiving that the populace had forced the guard of horse, crowded the great square before the palace, and were scaling the walls in several places, and beginning to pull them down to force their way in, he said to the sultan, before he gave the signal, I beg of your majesty to consider what you are going to do, since you will hazard your palace being destroyed, and who knows what fatal consequence may follow. My palace forced, replied the sultan, who can have that audacity? Sir, answered the grand vizier, if your majesty will but cast your eyes towards the great square and on the palace walls, you will perceive the truth of what I say. The sultan was so much alarmed when he saw so great a crowd, and how enraged they were, that he ordered the executioner to put his sabre immediately into the scabbard, to unbind Alla ad Deen, and at the same time commanded the porters to declare to the people that the sultan had pardoned him, and that they might retire. Those who had already got upon the walls, and were witnesses of what had passed, abandoned their design and got quickly down, overjoyed that they had saved the life of a man they dearly loved, and published the news amongst the rest, which was presently confirmed by the mace-bearers from the top of the terraces. The justice which the sultan had done to Alla ad Deen soon disarmed the populace of their rage. The tumult abated, and the mob dispersed. When Alla ad Deen found himself at liberty, he turned towards the balcony, and perceiving the sultan, raised his voice, and said to him in a moving manner, I beg of your majesty to add one favour more to that which I have already received, which is to let me know my crime. Your crime, answered the sultan, perfidious wretch, do you not know it? Come hither, and I will show it you. Alla ad Deen went up, when the sultan, going before him, without looking at him, said, Follow me, and then led him into his closet. When he came to the door, he said, Go in. You ought to know whereabouts your palace stood. Look round, and tell me what is become of it. Alla ad Deen looked, but saw nothing. He perceived the spot upon which his palace had stood, but not being able to divine how it had disappeared, was thrown into such confusion and amazement that he could not return one word of answer. The sultan, growing impatient, demanded of him again, Where is your palace, and what has become of my daughter? Alla ad Deen, breaking silence, replied, Sir, I perceive and own that the palace which I have built is not in its place, but is vanished. Neither can I tell your majesty where it may be, but can assure you I had no concern in its removal. I am not so much concerned about your palace, replied the sultan. I value my daughter ten thousand times more, and would have you find her out. Otherwise I will cause your head to be struck off, and no consideration shall divert me from my purpose. I beg of your majesty, answered Alla ad Deen, to grant me forty days to make my inquiries, and if in that time I have not the success I wish, I will offer my head at the foot of your throne, to be disposed of at your pleasure. I give you the forty days you ask, said the sultan, but think not to abuse the favour I show you, by imagining you shall escape my resentment, for I will find you out in whatsoever part of the world you may conceal yourself. Alla ad Deen went out of the sultan's presence with great humiliation, 
and in a condition worthy of pity. He crossed the courts of the palace, hanging down his head, and in such great confusion that he durst not lift up his eyes. The principal officers of the court, who had all professed themselves his friends, and whom he had never disobliged, instead of going up to him to comfort him and offer him a retreat in their houses, turned their backs to avoid seeing him. But had they accosted him with a word of comfort or offer of service, they would have no more known Allah ad -Din. He did not know himself, and was no longer in his senses, as plainly appeared by his asking everybody he met, and at every house, if they had seen his palace, or could tell him any news of it. These questions made the generality believe that Allah ad -Din was mad. Some laughed at him, but people of sense and humanity, particularly those who had had any connection of business or friendship with him, really pitied him. For three days he rambled about the city in this manner, without coming to any resolution, or eating anything but what some compassionate people forced him to take out of charity. At last, as he could no longer in his unhappy condition stay in a city where he had lately been next to the sultan, he took the road to the country, and after he had traversed several fields in wild uncertainty, at the approach of night came to the bank of a river. There, possessed by his despair, he said to himself, Where shall I seek my palace? In what province, country, or part of the world? Shall I find that, and my dear princess, whom the sultan expects from me? I shall never succeed. I had better free myself at once from fruitless endeavours, and such bitter grief as preys upon me. He was just going to throw himself into the river, but, as a good Mussulman, true to his religion, he thought he should not do it without first saying his prayers. Going to prepare himself, he went to the river's brink, in order to perform the usual ablutions. The place being steep and slippery from the water beating against it, he slid down, and had certainly fallen into the river, but for a little rock which projected about two feet out of the earth. Happily also for him, he still had on the ring which the African magician had put on his finger before he went down into the subterraneous abode to fetch the precious lamp. In slipping down the bank, he rubbed the ring so hard by holding on the rock, that immediately the same genie appeared whom he had seen in the cave where the magician had left him. "'What wouldst thou have?' said the genie. "'I am ready to obey thee as thy slave, and the slave of all those that have that ring on their finger, both I and the other slaves of the ring.' Ala ad -Din, agreeably surprised at an apparition he so little expected in his present calamity, replied, Save my life, genie, a second time, either by showing me to the place where the palace I caused to be built now stands, or immediately transporting it back where it first stood. What you command me, answered the genie, is not wholly in my power. I am only the slave of the ring. You must address yourself to the slave of the lamp. If that be the case, replied Allah ad -Din, I command thee, by the power of the ring, to transport me to the spot where my palace stands, in what part of the world soever it may be, and set me down under the window of the princess Badir al Badur. These words were no sooner out of his mouth than the genie transported him into Africa, to the midst of a large plain where his palace stood, at no great distance from a city, and placing him exactly under the window of the princess's apartment, left him. All this was done almost in an instant. Allah ad -Din, notwithstanding the darkness of the night, knew his palace and the princess Budir al Badur's apartment again. But as the night was far advanced and all was quiet in the palace, he retired to some distance, and sat down at the foot of a large tree. There, full of hopes, and reflecting on his happiness, for which he was indebted to chance, he found himself in a much more comfortable situation than when he was arrested and carried before the sultan. 
being now delivered from the immediate danger of losing his life. He amused himself for some time with these agreeable thoughts, but not having slept for two days, was not able to resist the drowsiness which came upon him, but fell fast asleep. The next morning, as soon as day appeared, Alla ad -Deen was agreeably awakened by the singing not only of the birds which had roosted in the tree under which he had passed the night, but also of those which frequented the thick groves of the palace garden. When he cast his eyes on that wonderful edifice, he felt inexpressible joy at thinking he might possibly soon be master of it again, and once more possess his dear princess, Badir al -Badur. Pleased with these hopes, he immediately arose, went towards the princess's apartment, and walked some time under her window, in expectation of her rising, that he might see her. During this expectation, he began to consider with himself whence the cause of his misfortune had proceeded. And after mature reflection, he no longer doubted that it was owing to having trusted the lamp out of his sight. He accused himself of negligence in letting it be a moment away from him. But what puzzled him most was, that he could not imagine who had been so envious of his happiness. He would soon have guessed this if he had known that both he and his palace were in Africa, the very name of which would soon have made him remember the magician, his declared enemy. But the genie, the slave of the ring, had not made the least mention of the name of the country, nor had Alla ad -Deen inquired. The princess rose earlier that morning than she had done since her transportation into Africa by the magician, whose presence she was forced to support once a day, because he was master of the palace. But she had always treated him so harshly that he dared not reside in it. As she was dressing, one of the women, looking through the window, perceived Alla ad -Deen, and instantly told her mistress. The princess, who could not believe the joyful tidings, hastened herself to the window, and seeing Alla ad -Deen, immediately opened it. The noise of opening the window made Alla ad -Deen turn his head that way, and perceiving the princess, he saluted her with an air that expressed his joy. "'To lose no time,' said she to him, "'I have sent to have the private door open for you. Enter and come up. The private door, which was just under the princess's apartment, was soon opened, and Alla ad -Deen conducted up into the chamber. It is impossible to express the joy of both at seeing each other, after so cruel a separation. After embracing and shedding tears of joy, they sat down, and Alla ad -Deen said, I beg of you, princess, in God's name, before we talk of anything else, to tell me, both for your own sake, the sultan your father's and mine, what is become of an old lamp which I left upon a shelf in my robing chamber when I departed for the chase. Alas, dear husband, answered the princess, I was afraid our misfortune might be owing to that lamp, and what grieves me most is that I have been the cause of it. Princess, replied Alla ad -Deen, do not blame yourself since it was entirely my fault, for I ought to have taken more care of it. But let us now think only of repairing the loss. Tell me what has happened, and into whose hands it has fallen. The princess then related how she had changed the old lamp for a new one, which she ordered to be fetched, that he might see it, and how the next morning she found herself in the unknown country they were then in, which she was told was Africa, by the traitor who had transported her thither by his magic art. Princess, said Alla ad -Deen, interrupting her, you have informed me who the traitor is by telling me we are in Africa. He is the most perfidious of men. But this is neither a time nor place to give you a full account of his villainies. I desire you only to tell me what he has done with the lamp and where he has put it. He carries it carefully wrapped up in his bosom, said the princess, and this I can assure you, because he pulled it out before me and showed it to me in triumph. Princess, said Alla ad -Deen, do not be displeased that I trouble you with so many questions, 
since they are equally important to us both. But to come to what most particularly concerns me, tell me, I conjure you, how so wicked and perfidious a man treats you. Since I have been here, replied the princess, he repairs once every day to see me, and I am persuaded the little satisfaction he receives from his visits makes him come no oftener. All his addresses tend to persuade me to break that faith I have pledged to you, and to take him for my husband, giving me to understand I need not entertain hopes of ever seeing you again, for that you were dead, having had your head struck off by the sultan, my father's order. He added, to justify himself, that you were an ungrateful wretch, that your good fortune was owing to him, and a great many other things of that nature, which I forbear to repeat. But as he received no other answer from me, but grievous complaints and tears, he was always forced to retire with as little satisfaction as he came. I doubt not his intention is to allow me time to overcome my grief, in hopes that afterwards I may change my sentiments, and if I persevere in an obstinate refusal, to use violence. But my dear husband's presence removes all my apprehensions. I am confident my attempts to punish the magician will not be in vain replied Alla ad -Din. since my princess's fears are removed, and I think I have found the means to deliver you from both your enemy and mine. To execute this design, it is necessary for me to go to the town. I shall return by noon, will then communicate my design, and what must be done by you to ensure success. But that you may not be surprised, I think it proper to acquaint you that I shall change my apparel, and beg of you to give orders that I may not wait long at the private door, but that it may be opened at the first knock, all which the princess promised to observe. When Alla ad -Din was out of the palace, he looked round him on all sides, and perceiving a peasant going into the country, hastened after him, and when he had overtaken him, made a proposal to him to change habits, which the man agreed to, when they had made the exchange, the countryman went about his business, and Alla ad -Din went to the city. After traversing several streets, he came to that part of the town where all descriptions of merchants and artisans had their particular streets, according to their trades. He went into that of the druggists, and going into one of the largest and best furnished shops, asked the druggist if he had a certain powder which he named. The druggist, judging Alla ad -Din by his habit to be very poor, and that he had not money enough to pay for it, told him he had it, but that it was very dear, upon which Alla ad -Din penetrated his thoughts, pulled out his purse, and, showing him some gold, asked for half a dram of the powder, which the druggist weighed, wrapped up in paper, and gave him, telling him the price was a piece of gold. Alla ad -Din put the money into his hand, and staying no longer in the town than just to get a little refreshment, returned to the palace, where he waited not long at the private door. When he came into the princess's apartment, he said to her, Princess, perhaps the aversion you tell me you have for your ravisher may be an objection to your executing what I am going to propose, but permit me to say it is proper that you should at this juncture dissemble a little, and do violence to your inclinations. If you would deliver yourself from him, and give my lord the sultan, your father, the satisfaction of seeing you again. If you will take my advice, continued he, dress yourself this moment in one of your richest habits, and when the African magician comes, make no difficulty to give him the best reception. Receive him with a cheerful countenance, so that he may imagine time has removed your affliction and disgust at his addresses. In your conversation, let him understand that you strive to forget me, and that he may be the more fully convinced of your sincerity, invite him to sup with you, and tell him you should be glad to taste of some of the best wines of his country. He will presently go to fetch you some. During his absence, put into one of the cups you are accustomed to drink out of, this powder, 
and setting it by charge the slave you may order that night to attend you on a signal you shall agree upon to bring that cup to you when the magician and you have eaten and drunk as much as you choose let her bring you the cup and then change cups with him he will esteem it so great a favour that he will not refuse but eagerly quaff it off but no sooner will he have drunk than you will see him fall backwards if you have any reluctance to drink out of his cup you may pretend only to do it without fear of being discovered for the effect of the powder is so quick that he will not have time to know whether you drink or not when alla ad deen had finished i own answered the princess i shall do myself great violence in consenting to make the magician such advances as i see are absolutely necessary but what cannot one resolve to do against a cruel enemy i will therefore follow your advice since both my repose and yours depend upon it after the princess had agreed to the measures proposed by alla ad deen he took his leave and went and spent the rest of the day in the neighbourhood of the palace till it was night and he might safely return to the private door the princess who had remained inconsolable at being separated not only from her husband whom she had loved from the first moment and still continued to love more out of inclination than duty but also from the sultan her father who had always showed the most tender and paternal affection for her had ever since their cruel separation lived in great neglect of her person she had almost forgotten the neatness so becoming persons of her sex and quality particularly after the first time the magician paid her a visit and she had understood by some of the women who knew him again that it was he who had taken the old lamp in exchange for a new one which rendered the sight of him more abhorred however the opportunity of taking the revenge he deserved made her resolve to gratify alla ad deen as soon therefore as he was gone she sat down to dress and was attired by her women to the best advantage in the richest habit of her wardrobe her girdle was of the finest and largest diamonds set in gold her necklace of pearls six on a side so well proportioned to that in the middle which was the largest ever seen and invaluable that the greatest sultaness would have been proud to have been adorned with only two of the smallest her bracelets which were of diamonds and rubies intermixed corresponded admirably to the richness of the girdle and necklace when the princess Badir al Badur was completely dressed she consulted her glass and women upon her adjustment and when she found she wanted no charms to flatter the foolish passion of the african magician she sat down on a sofa expecting his arrival the magician came at the usual hour and as soon as he entered the great hall where the princess waited to receive him she rose with an enchanting grace and smile and pointed with her hand to the most honourable place waiting till he sat down that she might sit at the same time which was a civility she had never shown him before the african magician dazzled more with the lustre of the princess's eyes than the glittering of the jewels with which she was adorned was much surprised the smiling and graceful air with which she received him so opposite to her former behaviour quite fascinated his heart when he was seated the princess to free him from his embarrassment broke silence first looking at him all the time in such a manner as to make him believe that he was not so odious to her as she had given him to understand hitherto and said you are doubtless amazed to find me so much altered to-day but your surprise will not be so great when i acquaint you that i am naturally of a disposition so opposite to melancholy and grief sorrow and uneasiness that i always strive to put them as far away as possible when i find the subject of them is past i have reflected on what you told me of alla ad deen's fate and know my father's temper so well that i am persuaded with you he could not escape the terrible effects of the sultan's rage therefore should i continue to lament him all my life my tears cannot recall him 
for this reason since i have paid all the duties decency requires of me to his memory now he is in the grave i think i ought to endeavour to comfort myself these are the motives of the change you see in me i am resolved to banish melancholy entirely and persuaded that you will bear me company to-night i have ordered a supper to be prepared but as i have no wines but those of china i have a great desire to taste of the produce of africa and doubt not you are procuring some of the best the african magician who had looked upon the happiness of getting so soon and so easily into the princess Badir al badur's good graces as impossible could not think of words expressive enough to testify how sensible he was of her favours but to put an end the sooner to a conversation which would have embarrassed him if he had engaged farther in it he turned it upon the wines of africa and said of all the advantages africa can boast that of producing the most excellent wines is one of the principal i have a vessel of seven years old which has never been broached and it is indeed not praising it too much to say it is the finest wine in the world if my princess added he will give me leave i will go and fetch two bottles and return again immediately i shall be sorry to give you that trouble replied the princess you had better send for them it is necessary i should go myself answered the african magician for nobody but myself knows where the key of the cellar is laid or has the secret to unlock the door if it be so said the princess make haste back for the longer you stay the greater will be my impatience and we shall sit down to supper as soon as you return end of section twenty two Section 23 of The Arabian Nights Entertainments, Volume 3, translated by Jonathan Scott. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Gillian Hendry. The Story of Ala Adin, or The Wonderful Lamp, Part 8. The African magician, full of hopes of his expected happiness, rather flew than ran and returned quickly with the wine. The princess, not doubting but he would make haste, put with her own hand the powder Alla ad had given her into the cup set apart for that purpose. They sat down at the table opposite to each other, the magician's back towards the sideboard. The princess presented him with the best at the table, and said to him, If you please, I will entertain you with a concert of vocal and instrumental music, but as we are only two, I think conversation may be more agreeable. This the magician took as a new favour. After they had eaten some time, the princess called for some wine, drank the magician's health, and afterwards said to him, Indeed, you had a full right to commend your wine, since I never tasted any so delicious. Charming princess, said he, holding in his hand the cup which had been presented to him, my wine becomes more exquisite by your approbation. Then drink my health, replied the princess. You will find I understand wines. He drank the princess's health, and returning the cup said, I think myself fortunate, princess, that I reserved this wine for so happy an occasion, and own I never before drank any in every respect so excellent. When they had each drunk two or three cups more, the princess, who had completely charmed the African magician by her civility and obliging behaviour, gave the signal to the slave who served them with wine, bidding her bring the cup which had been filled for her and at the same time bring the magician a full goblet. When they both had their cups in their hands, she said to him, I know not how you express your loves in these parts when drinking together. With us in China, the lover and his mistress reciprocally exchange cups and drink each other's health. At the same time, she presented to him the cup which was in her hand, 
and held out her hand to receive his. He hastened to make the exchange with the more pleasure, because he looked upon this favour as the most certain token of an entire conquest over the princess, which raised his rapture to the highest pitch. Before he drank, he said to her, with the cup in his hand, "'Indeed, princess, we Africans are not so refined in the art of love as you Chinese, and your instructing me in a lesson I was ignorant of informs me how sensible I ought to be of the favour done me. I shall never, lovely princess, forget my recovering, by drinking out of your cup, that life which your cruelty, had it continued, must have made me despair of. The princess, who began to be tired with this impertinent declaration of the African magician, interrupted him, and said, Let us drink first, and then say what you will afterwards. At the same time she set the cup to her lips, while the African magician, who was eager to get his wine off first, drank up the very last drop. In finishing it he had reclined his head back to show his eagerness, and remained some time in that state. The princess kept the cup at her lips, till she saw his eyes turn in his head, when he fell backwards lifeless on the sofa. The princess had no occasion to order the private door to be opened to Alla ad -Din, for her women were so disposed from the great hall to the foot of the staircase, that the word was no sooner given that the African magician was fallen backwards, than the door was immediately opened. As soon as Alla ad -Din entered the hall, he saw the magician stretched backwards on the sofa. The princess rose from her seat, and ran overjoyed to embrace him. But he stopped her, and said, "'Princess, it is not yet time. Oblige me by retiring to your apartment, and let me be left alone a moment, while I endeavour to transport you back to China, as speedily as you were brought from thence.' When the princess, her women and eunuchs, were gone out of the hall, Alla ad -Din shut the door, and going directly to the dead body of the magician, opened his vest, took out the lamp, which was carefully wrapped up, as the princess had told him, and unfolding and rubbing it, the genie immediately appeared. "'Genie,' said Alla ad -Din, "'I have called to command thee, on the part of thy good mistress, this lamp.' to transport this palace instantly into China, to the place from whence it was brought hither. The genie bowed his head in token of obedience, and disappeared. Immediately the palace was transported into China, and its removal was only felt by two little shocks, the one when it was lifted up, the other when it was set down, and both in a very short interval of time. Alla ad went to the princess's apartment, and embracing her, said, I can assure you, princess, that your joy and mine will be complete to-morrow morning. The princess, guessing that Alla ad must be hungry, ordered the dishes, served up in the great hall, to be brought down. The princess and Alla ad ate as much as they thought fit, and drank of the African magician's old wine during which time their conversation could not be otherwise than satisfactory, and then they retired to their own chamber. From the time of the transportation of Alla ad -Din's palace, the princess's father had been inconsolable for the loss of her. He could take no rest, and instead of avoiding what might continue his affliction, he indulged it without restraint. Before the disaster he used to go every morning into his closet, to please himself with viewing the palace. He went now many times in the day to renew his tears, and plunge himself into the deepest melancholy, by the idea of no more seeing that which once gave him so much pleasure, and reflecting how he had lost what was most dear to him in this world. The very morning of the return of Alla ad -Din's palace, the sultan went, by break of day, into his closet to indulge his sorrows. Absorbed in himself, and in a pensive mood, he cast his eyes towards the spot, expecting only to see an open space. But perceiving the vacancy filled up, he at first imagined the appearance to be the effect of a fog. Looking more attentively, he was convinced, beyond the power of doubt, it was his son-in-law's palace. 
joy and gladness succeeded to sorrow and grief he returned immediately into his apartment and ordered a horse to be saddled and brought to him without delay which he mounted that instant thinking he could not make haste enough to the palace Allah ad deen who foresaw what would happen rose that morning by daybreak put on one of the most magnificent habits his wardrobe afforded and went up into the hall of twenty-four windows from whence he perceived the sultan approaching and got down soon enough to receive him at the foot of the great staircase and to help him to dismount Allah ad deen said the sultan i cannot speak to you till i have seen and embraced my daughter he led the sultan into the princess's apartment the happy father embraced her with his face bathed in tears of joy and the princess on her side showed him all the testimonies of the extreme pleasure the sight of him afforded her the sultan was some time before he could open his lips so great was his surprise and joy to find his daughter again after he had given her up for lost and the princess upon seeing her father let fall tears of rapture and affection at last the sultan broke silence and said i would believe daughter your joy to see me makes you seem as little changed as if no misfortune had befallen you yet i cannot be persuaded but that you have suffered much alarm for a large palace cannot be so suddenly transported as yours has been without causing great fright and apprehension i would have you tell me all that has happened and conceal nothing from me the princess who took great pleasure in giving the sultan the satisfaction he demanded said if i appear so little altered i beg of your majesty to consider that i received new life yesterday morning by the presence of my dear husband and deliverer allah ad deen whom i looked upon and bewailed as lost to me and the happiness of seeing and embracing of whom has almost recovered me to my former state of health my greatest suffering was only to find myself forced from your majesty and my dear husband not only from the love i bore my husband but from the uneasiness i laboured under through fear that he though innocent might feel the effects of your anger to which i knew he was left exposed i suffered but little from the insolence of the wretch who had carried me off for having secured the ascendant over him i always put a stop to his disagreeable overtures and was as little constrained as i am at present as to what relates to my transportation allah ad deen had no concern in it i was myself the innocent cause of it to persuade the sultan of the truth of what she said she gave him a full account of how the african magician had disguised himself and offered to change new lamps for old ones how she had amused herself in making that exchange being entirely ignorant of the secret and importance of the wonderful lamp how the palace and herself were carried away and transported into africa with the african magician who was recognized by two of her women and the eunuch who made the exchange of the lamp when he had the audacity after the success of his daring enterprise to propose himself for her husband how he persecuted her till allah ad deen's arrival how they had concerted measures to get the lamp from him again and the success they had fortunately met with by her dissimulation in inviting him to supper and giving him the cup with the powder prepared for him for the rest added she i leave it to allah ad deen to recount Allah ad deen had not much to tell the sultan but only said when the private door was opened i went up into the great hall where i found the magician lying dead on the sofa and as i thought it not proper for the princess to stay there any longer i desired her to go down into her own apartment with her women and eunuchs as soon as i was alone and had taken the lamp out of the magician's breast i made use of the same secret he had done to remove the palace and carry off the princess and by that means the palace was reconveyed to the place where it stood before and i have the happiness to restore the princess to your majesty as you commanded me 
but that your majesty may not think that i impose upon you if you will give yourself the trouble to go up into the hall you may see the magician punished as he deserved the sultan to be assured of the truth rose instantly and went into the hall where when he saw the african magician dead and his face already livid by the strength of the poison he embraced alla ad deen with great tenderness and said my son be not displeased at my proceedings against you they arose from my paternal love and therefore you ought to forgive the excesses to which it hurried me sir replied alla ad deen i have not the least reason to complain of your majesty's conduct since you did nothing but what your duty required this infamous magician the basest of men was the sole cause of my misfortune when your majesty has leisure i will give you an account of another villainous action he was guilty of towards me which was no less black and base than this from which i was preserved by the providence of god in a very miraculous way i will take an opportunity and that very shortly replied the sultan to hear it but in the meantime let us think only of rejoicing and the removal of this odious object alla ad deen ordered the magician's corpse to be removed and thrown upon a dunghill for birds and beasts to prey upon in the meantime the sultan commanded the drums trumpets cymbals and other instruments of music to announce his joy to the public and a festival of ten days to be proclaimed for the return of the princess and alla ad deen thus alla ad deen escaped once more the almost inevitable danger of losing his life but this was not the last since he ran as great a hazard a third time the african magician had a younger brother who was equally skilful as a necromancer and even surpassed him in villainy and pernicious designs as they did not live together or in the same city but oftentimes when one was in the east the other was in the west they failed not every year to inform themselves by their art each where the other resided and whether they stood in need of one another's assistance some time after the african magician had failed in his enterprise against alla ad deen his younger brother who had heard no tidings of him and was not in africa but in a distant country had the wish to know in what part of the world he sojourned the state of his health and what he was doing and as he as well as his brother always carried a geomantic square instrument about him he prepared the sand cast the points and drew the figures on examining the planetary mansions he found that his brother was no longer living but had been poisoned and by another observation that he was in the capital of the kingdom of china also that the person who had poisoned him was of mean birth though married to a princess a sultan's daughter when the magician had informed himself of his brother's fate he lost no time in useless regret which could not restore him to life but resolving immediately to revenge his death departed for china where after crossing plains rivers mountains deserts and a long tract of country without delay he arrived after incredible fatigues when he came to the capital of china he took a lodging the next day he walked through the town not so much to observe the beauties which were indifferent to him as to take proper measures to execute his pernicious designs he introduced himself into the most frequented places where he listened to everybody's discourse in a place where people resort to divert themselves with games of various kinds and where some were conversing while others played he heard some persons talk of the virtue and piety of a woman called fatima who was retired from the world and of the miracles she wrought as he fancied that this woman might be serviceable to him in the project he had conceived he took one of the company aside and requested to be informed more particularly who that holy woman was and what sort of miracles she performed what said the person whom he addressed have you never seen or heard of her she is the admiration of the whole town 
for her fasting her austerities and her exemplary life except mondays and fridays she never stirs out of her little cell and on those days on which she comes into the town she does an infinite deal of good for there is not a person that has the headache but is cured by her laying her hand upon them the magician wanted no further information he only asked the person in what part of the town this holy woman's cell was situated after he had informed himself on this head he determined on the detestable design of murdering her and assuming her character with this view he watched all her steps the first day she went out after he had made this inquiry without losing sight of her till evening when he saw her re-enter her cell when he had fully observed the place he went to one of the houses where they sell a certain hot liquor and where any person may pass the night particularly in the great heats when the people of that country prefer lying on a mat to a bed about midnight after the magician had satisfied the master of the house for what little he had called for he went out and proceeded directly to the cell of fatima he had no difficulty to open the door which was only fastened with a latch and he shut it again after he had entered without any noise when he entered the cell he perceived fatima by moonlight lying in the air on a sofa covered only by an old mat with her head leaning against the wall he awakened her and clapped a dagger to her breast the pious fatima opening her eyes was much surprised to see a man with a dagger at her breast ready to stab her and who said to her if you cry out or make the least noise i will kill you but get up and do as i shall direct you fatima who had lain down in her habit got up trembling with fear do not be so much frightened said the magician i only want your habit give it me and take mine accordingly fatima and he changed clothes he then said to her colour my face that i may be like you but perceiving that the poor creature could not help trembling to encourage her he said i tell you again you need not fear anything i swear by the name of god i will not take away your life fatima lighted her lamp led him into the cell and dipping a soft brush in a certain liquor rubbed it over his face assured him the colour would not change and that his face was of the same hue as her own after which she put her own headdress on his head also a veil with which she showed him how to hide his face as he passed through the town after this she put a long string of beads about his neck which hung down to the middle of his body and giving him the stick she used to walk with in his hand brought him a looking-glass and bade him look if he was not as like her as possible the magician found himself disguised as he wished to be but he did not keep the oath he so solemnly swore to the good fatima but instead of stabbing her for fear the blood might discover him he strangled her and when he found she was dead threw her body into a cistern just by the cell the magician thus disguised like the holy woman fatima spent the remainder of the night in the cell the next morning two hours after sunrise though it was not a day the holy woman used to go out on he crept out of the cell being well persuaded that no one would ask him any questions or if they should he had an answer ready for them as one of the first things he did after his arrival was to find out alla ad deen's palace where he was to complete his designs he went directly thither as soon as the people saw the holy woman as they imagined him to be they presently gathered about him in a great crowd some begged his blessing others kissed his hand and others more reserved only the hem of his garment while others whether their heads ached or they wished to be preserved against that disorder stooped for him to lay his hands upon them which he did muttering some words in form of prayer and in short counterfeited so well that everybody took him for the holy woman after frequently stopping to satisfy people of this description 
who received neither good nor harm from this imposition of hands, he came at last to the square before Alla ad Deen's palace. The crowd was so great that the eagerness to get at him increased in proportion. Those who were the most zealous and strong forced their way through the crowd. There were such quarrels and so great a noise that the princess, who was in the hall of four-and-twenty windows, heard it, and asked what was the matter. But nobody being able to give her an answer, she ordered them to inquire and inform her. One of her women looked out of the window, and then told her it was a great crowd of people collected about the holy woman to be cured of the headache by the imposition of her hands. The princess, who had long heard of this holy woman, but had never seen her, was very desirous to have some conversation with her, which the chief of the eunuchs perceiving told her it was an easy matter to bring her to her, if she desired and commanded it. And the princess expressing her wishes, he immediately sent four eunuchs for the pretended holy woman. As soon as the crowd saw the eunuchs, they made way, and the magician, perceiving also that they were coming for him, advanced to meet them, overjoyed to find his plot proceeded so well. "'Holy woman,' said one of the eunuchs, "'the princess wants to see you, and has sent us for you.' "'The princess does me too great an honour," replied the false Fatima. "'I am ready to obey her command.' and at the same time followed the eunuchs to the palace. When the magician, who, under a holy garment, disguised a wicked heart, was introduced into the great hall, and perceived the princess, he began a prayer which contained a long enumeration of vows and good wishes for the princess's health and prosperity, and that she might have everything she desired. He then displayed all his hypocritical rhetoric, to insinuate himself into the princess's favour under the cloak of piety, which it was no hard matter for him to do, for as the princess herself was naturally good, she was easily persuaded that all the world were like her, especially those who made profession of serving God in solitude. When the pretended Fatima had finished his long harangue, the princess said to him, "'I thank you, good mother, for your prayers.' I have great confidence in them, and hope God will hear them. Come and sit by me. The false Fatima sat down with affected modesty. The princess, then resuming her discourse, said, My good mother, I have one thing to request, which you must not refuse me. It is to stay with me, that you may edify me with your way of living, and that I may learn from your good example how to serve God. "'Princess,' said the counterfeit Fatima, "'I beg of you not to ask what I cannot consent to, "'without neglecting my prayers and devotion.' "'That shall be no hindrance to you,' answered the princess. "'I have a great many apartments unoccupied. "'You shall choose which you like best, "'and have as much liberty to perform your devotions "'as if you were in your own cell.' The magician, who desired nothing more than to introduce himself into the palace, where it would be a much easier matter for him to execute his designs, under the favour and protection of the princess, than if he had been forced to come and go from the cell to the palace, did not urge much to excuse himself from accepting the obliging offer which the princess made him. "'Princess,' said he, "'whatever resolution a poor wretched woman as I am may have made me renounce the pomp and grandeur of this world. I dare not presume to oppose the will and commands of so pious and charitable a princess. Upon this the princess, rising up, said, Come with me. I will show you what vacant apartments I have, that you may make choice of that you like best. The magician followed the princess, and of all the apartments she showed him, made choice of that which was the worst furnished, saying it was too good for him, and that he only accepted of it to please her. Afterwards the princess would have brought him back again into the great hall, to make him dine with her, but he, considering that he should then be obliged to show his face, 
which he had always taken care to conceal and fearing that the princess should find out that he was not fatima he begged of her earnestly to excuse him telling her that he never ate anything but bread and dried fruits and desiring to eat that slight repast in his own apartment the princess granted his request saying you may be as free here good mother as if you were in your own cell i will order you a dinner but remember i expect you as soon as you have finished your repast after the princess had dined and the false fatima had been informed by one of the eunuchs that she was risen from table he failed not to wait upon her my good mother said the princess i am overjoyed to have the company of so holy a woman as yourself who will confer a blessing upon this palace but now i am speaking of the palace pray how do you like it and before i show it all to you tell me first what you think of this hall upon this question the counterfeit fatima who to act his part the better affected to hang down his head without so much as ever once lifting it at last looked up and surveyed the hall from one end to the other when he had examined it well he said to the princess as far as such a solitary being as i am who am unacquainted with what the world calls beautiful can judge this hall is truly admirable and most beautiful there wants but one thing what is that good mother demanded the princess tell me i conjure you for my part i always believed and have heard say it wanted nothing but if it does it shall be supplied princess said the false fatima with great dissimulation forgive me the liberty i have taken but my opinion is if it can be of any importance that if a rose egg were hung up in the middle of the dome this hall would have no parallel in the four quarters of the world and your palace would be the wonder of the universe my good mother said the princess what bird is a roe and where may one get an egg princess replied the pretended fatima it is a bird of prodigious size which inhabits the summit of mount caucasus the architect who built your palace can get you one after the princess had thanked the false fatima for what she believed her good advice she conversed with her upon other matters but could not forget the rose egg which she resolved to request of alla ad deen when he returned from hunting he had been gone six days which the magician knew and therefore took advantage of his absence but he returned that evening after the false fatima had taken leave of the princess and retired to his apartment as soon as he arrived he went directly to the princess's apartment saluted and embraced her but she seemed to receive him coldly my princess said he i think you are not so cheerful as you used to be has anything happened during my absence which has displeased you or given you any trouble or dissatisfaction in the name of god do not conceal it from me i will leave nothing undone that is in my power to please you it is a trifling matter replied the princess which gives me so little concern that i could not have thought you could have perceived it in my countenance but since you have unexpectedly discovered some alteration i will no longer disguise a matter of so little consequence from you i always believed continued the princess that our palace was the most superb magnificent and complete in the world but i will tell you now what i find fault with upon examining the hall of four-and-twenty windows do not you think with me that it would be complete if a rose egg were hung up in the midst of the dome princess replied alla ad deen it is enough that you think there wants such an ornament you shall see by the diligence used to supply that deficiency that there is nothing which i would not do for your sake alla ad deen left the princess badir al badur that moment and went up into the hall of four-and-twenty windows where pulling out of his bosom the lamp which after the danger he had been exposed to 
he always carried about him, he rubbed it, upon which the genie immediately appeared. Genie, said Alla ad -Deen, there wants a rose egg to be hung up in the midst of the dome. I command thee, in the name of this lamp, to repair the deficiency. Alla ad -Deen had no sooner pronounced these words than the genie gave so loud and terrible a cry that the hall shook, and Alla ad -Deen could scarcely stand upright. What, wretch, said the genie, in a voice that would have made the most undaunted man tremble, is it not enough that I and my companions have done everything for you, but you, by an unheard-of ingratitude, must command me to bring my master and hang him up in the midst of this dome? This attempt deserves that you, your wife, and your palace should be immediately reduced to ashes. But you are happy that this request does not come from yourself. Know then that the true author is the brother of the African magician, your enemy, whom you have destroyed as he deserved. He is now in your palace, disguised in the habit of the holy woman Fatima, whom he has murdered, and it is he who has suggested to your wife to make this pernicious demand. His design is to kill you, therefore take care of yourself. After these words, the genie disappeared. Allah ad -Deen lost not a word of what the genie had said. He had heard talk of the holy woman Fatima, and how she pretended to cure the headache. He returned to the princess's apartment, and without mentioning a word of what had happened, sat down and complained of a great pain which had suddenly seized his head, upon which the princess ordered the holy woman to be called, and then told him how she had invited her to the palace, and that she had appointed her an apartment. When the pretended Fatima came, Alla ad -Deen said, Come hither, good mother. I am glad to see you here at so fortunate a time. I am tormented with a violent pain in my head, and request your assistance, by the confidence I have in your good prayers, and hope you will not refuse me that favour which you do to so many persons afflicted with this complaint. So saying, he arose, but held down his head. The counterfeit Fatima advanced towards him, with his hand all the time on a dagger concealed in his girdle under his gown, which, Allah ad -Deen observing, he seized his hand before he had drawn it, pierced him to the heart with his own dagger, and then pushed him down on the floor. "'My dear husband, what have you done?' cried the princess in surprise. "'You have killed the holy woman!' No, my princess, answered Alla ad -Deen with emotion, I have not killed Fatima, but a villain who would have assassinated me if I had not prevented him. This wicked wretch, added he, uncovering his face, has strangled Fatima, whom you accuse me of killing, and disguised himself in her clothes with intent to murder me. But that you may know him better, he is brother to the African magician." Alla ad -Deen then informed her how he came to know these particulars, and afterwards ordered the dead body to be taken away. Thus was Alla ad -Deen delivered from the persecution of two brothers who were magicians. Within a few years afterwards, the sultan died in a good old age, and as he left no male children, the princess Budir al Badur, as lawful heir of the throne, succeeded him and communicating the power to Alla ad -Deen, they reigned together many years, and left a numerous and illustrious posterity. End of section 23 End of the story of Alla ad -Deen, or The Wonderful Lamp